Because people came here not knowing how to do the practice, Sayadawji has been speaking bit by bit, day by day, and his um, talking about the practice is not finished yet. He's been talking basically about how to do the practice, and it's his job to explain what the texts say. Without relying on the texts, if he just speaks, it will amount to saying just what he thinks. So he has spoken relying on the texts. And in the remaining three quarters of the retreat, to some extent he will have to repeat himself because some yogis still aren't able to practice well yet. Um, He said that one has to always have sati and he sees that some yogis are weak in this area so he has to speak so as to boost this up. He has to um, strengthen this, help strengthen this. But some yogis really aren't even, haven't even collected their minds yet, haven't even get, uh, developed concentration. And if the yogi has not been able to see the difference between mind and matter, discern nama and rupa at this stage, then there's not much hope for the yogi to progress in the remaining three quarters of the retreat. But there there is hope. If the yogis listen carefully and then work according to the instructions, work exactly, then there's hope for yogis to improve from this point on. So this is a practical dhamma. It's not just for listening to It's for applying. So if you came here because you didn't know how to do the practice, then it's appropriate to listen carefully to what is being said in the talks. And only then will one get the benefit of coming here. The monks have been instructing the yogis who come abroad as Sayadawji mentioned earlier, as a relative. Uh, Sayadawji mentioned that we are all related on three levels, as Asian relatives, as world relatives, and as relatives in samsara. The Dhamma is that which lifts one up which purifies one, one's existence. And in giving the Dhamma gift, Sayadawji wants to be related on a Dhamma level. So that is why he, he gives the Dhamma gift. He's not, he doesn't see it as teacher and student, but as one relative to another. And when, when one gives a gift, some things that are given are, deep, are to be put away in a cabinet and just looked at. Some things are to be put away and only used from time to time. But some things are to be used right away. And the practice of Satipatthana is something that the yogis should use right away and also to cherish. So one should work in three ways, as Sayadawji mentioned, to work respectfully, sakajakirya, and to work meticulously without taking a break, satachakirya, and to uh, to not let one's self stagnate, anatita kirya. So if one works in these ways, applying the gift of satipatthana, Every second, it will be worthwhile. Sierroji is giving the gift, and then the giver will be delighted because he'll look and he'll say, "Oh, they're using what I gave them. 
and he'll feel very happy. The teachers will feel this way, and they will be very keen to give again. So the recipients of the gift need to understand this and use the Dhamma gift respectfully every second of the time. Sieroji urges everyone seriously. For the people of the world, blood, sick, blood circulation is important and everyone needs to take care of themselves in order to have good blood circulation. So we take care with what we eat. We take care to get enough exercise and we take care to get enough rest so that our blood circulation will be good. We have to take care for this to happen. And when our blood circulation is good, then we'll have good ability to resist disease. And if we do get sick, we'll be able to get better quickly. Sometimes we can even get better without taking any medicines. So for all of us, there are various kinds of diseases, physical disease, that surround us. And there's also mental disease that surround, surrounds us. And these diseases make the mind dirty. They make the mind uh, very sick. So there's loba, just ordinary wanting, selfish greed, extreme greed. There's dosa, dissatisfaction, anger, resentment, hatred, delusion, not knowing, mana, pride, jealousy. So these are some of the diseases that are surrounding us. And if they enter into one's being, then they, then they can make the mind very bad. So the Buddha preached a way to dispel mental disease over 2,500 years ago. And if we listen carefully how to apply this method, and, uh, sorry, if we listen carefully, if we listen carefully to apply this method, and then it will bring results that are consistent with the practice. So the quality of the, of the Dhamma as being well preached, svakata, will become evident when we apply it. And applying the practice of the Dhamma, the Dhamma blood becomes clean. Day by day, our circulation improves. And this is very good. So just as the way, just as we have to take care in our lives to make sure that our blood, our, our real physical blood circulates well so that we can be healthy, so too, in order for this clean blood of the Dhamma to replace the diseased blood in our being, we need to take care. This is an extremely important task. And as Sayadawji mentioned, this is something that is so important that it can't not be done. It has to be done. And it has to be done by ourselves, not by someone else for us. We have to do it in time and on time before it's too late and regularly. And if the Dhamma blood enters into our being and circulates well throughout, then our physical our verbal and our, our mental behavior will become clean. And in that way, we won't cause any suffering to those around us, to the environment. So to the extent that we practice, our blood circulation will become good, our Dhamma blood. And as we have to avoid 
eating unsuitable food and remember to eat things that suit us, so too we have to um, remember to avoid what is unsuitable for us and put in that which is suitable. So doing this, uh, if we all practice the Dhamma and develop the Dhamma blood, good, healthy Dhamma blood, then the Dhamma family will arise in the world, and this is very much needed. For the Dhamma to circulate well in our beings, the method is very easy. As soon as the object arises, aim, apply effort, observe steadfastly. So mental effort has to be present. One has to push the mind to reach the object, but not too much. It can't, one can't overdo it. It has to be, the mind has to be pushed uh, just enough to reach the object. So we use aiming in order for our effort to be proper. The push is needed to get the object get the mind to the object uh, and not elsewhere. And the aim is needed so that we don't miss. So when at the moment, at the, when do we do this? We have to do this at the present moment when the object arises. So here the word object, it means the thing which we are observing, the object of observation. The, what that which can be observed. And in the moment of seeing, what can be observed is the eye base, the visible object, the thing seen. And then there's seeing consciousness, contact and feeling. So when seeing arises, apply effort, aim, observe steadfastly. Then, too, in hearing, at the moment of hearing, apply effort, aim, and observe steadfastly. In the moment of hearing, there's the ear, and the sound, which is heard, knowing the sound, contact, and feeling. These things are really there in the moment of hearing. And because they are really there, the Buddha taught us to observe at the moment of hearing. When smelling arises, at the moment of smelling, apply effort, aim, observe steadfastly. At the moment of smelling, there's the nose, there's the odor which is smelled, and there's knowing the smell, contact, and feeling good or bad. these things are really there. And for beings who can't live without food, we have a tongue. And on the tongue, there are receptors that can capture the taste of food. So the tongue is, this receptor for food is something that is really there. And then in the food, There are flavors, six types of flavors, sweet, sour, bitter, salty, spicy, and bland. And whenever one of these tastes, if there's something sweet that touches the tongue, then one can know that sweet taste. There's contact and feeling. If something sour touches the tongue, then, too, there's knowing the sour taste. If something bitter touches the tongue, or salty, or spicy, or bland, there's knowing the taste, and there's contact and feeling. These are all there in the moment of tasting. And because they are there, the Buddha taught us to, do, to observe them. Touch can be felt any part of the body where there's moisture. The places which are dry, like the teeth or the hair, nails, 
those don't those dry places don't have the capability of feeling but any place where there's moisture there's the capability of receiving touch and what can be felt is soft hard roughness gentleness cold heat stiffness tension pulling movement so when according to the text in a, in technical terms the elements which form tangible objects are the earth element that has hardness and softness the element of temperature which manifests as hot or cold and the element of air which is tension movement and so on so these three <clears throat> these three elements combine to make tangible objects and when something that is predominantly soft strikes the body base then we know softness when something is hard and strikes the body base then we know the hardness when something hot we know the hot, the heat when something cold predominantly cold strikes the body base then we know the coldness when warmth strikes the body base we know warmth when there's something predominantly stiff striking the body base we know stiffness when something tense strikes the body base we know tension so one knows whatever tangible object touches the body base and this is very simple one doesn't need to have a lot of learning to be able to understand this to be able to practice this and to be able to speak about it even a child can describe this sort of thing and a child can meditate so just knowing like this is enough one doesn't need a lot of learning so when um the knowing something a mental object is not like the previous ways of knowing when <clears throat> it's more a nature of the mind takes an object that is it seems like we are hearing it seems like we are smelling tasting touching and so on but we're not really it's a, an imaginary object and people think that where this uh, knowing of imagination or knowing uh knowing things in the mind uh, westerners think that this happens in the brain but according to the buddhist literature it takes place in the heart this is the base for mental objects to arise and one one mind moment follows another so in that way at this point we don't really you know when when tastes smells touches and so on occur in the mind we aren't really smelling tasting touching and so on but we know as if we as if we are and in this moment mind and matter are occurring so we can't deny that these things are happening that these things are really there because it is there the buddha said to know this observe what am i what is in me what is in us is nama and rupa mind and matter and these are related as cause and effect they change in various ways and if we examine this a lot if we observe this a lot the mind becomes clean and as Siraji spoke about yesterday the other day when we grind a lens its magnifying power can be increased and we can see we can grind a lens so that we are able to see things that are very far away we can also see things that are very very small and see close up much much uh, cl- more closely than we could with our ordinary eyes so when we want to see what we can't see with our ordinary wi- eyes we have to have a lens that is properly ground 
and then there will be enough magnifying power in the lens uh, we will be able to see so grinding is pro- grinding has to be properly done and this is what we try to do in the practice for this the yogis are practicing and as we improve our ability to see we have to get rid of the factors which cloud the mind we have to get rid of loba dosa and moha moha covers over what is there so we eliminate these factors through the practice and the mind becomes clean and then one will be able to see so at the start what we are trying to do is to make our mind clean second after second so to do this we observe every arising object always always applying effort but when we apply effort to observe the arising object then laziness can't enter the mind when we aim the mind then it doesn't slip off and we should think then well what is the mind like at that moment at that moment is the mind clean or not the moment at that the mind at that moment is clean so what we have to do is to make this mind occur one after another so that we can build up our energy and in one minute there's 60 seconds but if we don't uh if we don't calculate at the rate of one observation per second if we just use one observation every every other second still in one minute that's 30 times per minute so if we calculate in this way that is 30 times in a minute that we are making the mind clean so first of all this is what we need to do to make the mind clean and after that sati will occur later it will it can't help but occur it will definitely arise and sati protects the mind from the defilements it guards the mind it blockades the mind so that loba and dosa greed and anger can't arise and with the help of aim then sati sticks to the object and be, and the and the mind becomes collected so when the mind is collected this is kanika samadhi momentary concentration and at that with kanika samadhi the mind doesn't scatter the mind is collected this is called sampendana in pali so at the first this is very important so in every noting then uh, this is these with these energies present the mind is clear and the next moment of observation the mind is clean third moment of observation the mind is clean so one after another the mind and and the mentality are clean so at that moment the mind is free of fault it's blameless there's no desire to kill arising because there's no anger there's no desire to kill or harm there's no di- desire to lie in order to harm others and because no greed can arise there's no thoughts of stealing no thoughts of committing adultery no thoughts of lying for one's own selfish benefit and when knowledge arises then one understands that use of alcohol and drugs is not beneficial so in this way 
we become well-tamed and well-cultured. To the extent that the mind becomes collected, then energy develops. And in doing this, one gets the better of the defilements. If one can continue to do this, one can gain the uh, when one can gain the upper hand over the defilements for the rest of one's life. And this is true revolution. This is a real victory when one gains this type of victory over the over the defilements. So in the, this practice makes the mind clean and this this is very good. If we don't know then we don't gain these energies in each moment. In any, when we observe and collect the mind and develop these energies, then with every moment of observation we are gaining. If one can't do the practice, or if one can't do it at all, if one can do it but not carefully, then there are qualities that uh, we have tendencies towards kama chanda, sense desire, uh, anger, doubt, restlessness and remorse, and extreme laziness. These qualities block the clean mind. These are obstacles to concentration. And they, if these enter the mind, then the clean mind can't arise. And they weaken knowledge. So these nivaranas, these obstacles to the clean mind, are very bad. If one observes a lot, even though no knowledge has arisen yet, one is free of these qualities, these nivaranas. So one has to clear these away. If one can clear them away, then the mind, um, then the mind becomes accurate. The mind is able to focus accurately on the object, and then one is able to see what is there. So one can't know like this right from the start. So, and if people think that they can, um, if if people think that they can just know directly without developing these qualities, without clearing away the nivaranas and so on, how they are knowing is is in a way that involves thinking. It's a, uh, they're, they're, what they know is involved in the level of manner and form not direct knowledge yet so as Sayadawji mentioned with the uh, example of the magnifying glass when the glass is ground to have more power than one can see and when the mind becomes clean, then this is very good when it becomes free of the obstacles to concentration. So, <clears throat> when one is able to clear the mind of the nivaranas and make the mind clean, then knowledge will begin to arise and one will see that there is mind and matter. And from, from that point, one will see how mind and matter are related as cause and effect. All one needs to do is observe to make one's notings consecutive. So one should think about things the way uh, one should try to make one's notings to, to be touching one right after another the way these uh, floorboards on a parquet floor are. When there's no gap between the floorboards, then dust can't get in. 
So when there's a gap, however, then dust gets in and it's very hard to clean. So it's important for the mind to be clean one second after another. So here, the, uh, the, these floorboards, they're touching each other and they're stuck together with glue. So if in a similar way, our mind can be occurring one right after another, this clean mind, mind of observation, then the dust of the kilesas can't get in between in the gaps between our observation. If there is a gap where we're missing, then the kilesas are sure to get in. So understanding this, except for one, when one is fast asleep, there is always nama rupa happening. So of course it's happening when we're asleep too, but we can't observe it when we're asleep. But when we are awake, we need to be trying to observe every second of the time. So without any effort, then laziness will enter our mind stream. And without any aiming, the mind will slip off the object. So conversely, with aiming, there will be no laziness. Sorry, with effort, there will be no laziness. And with aiming, the mind won't slip off. So, at the start, for this to happen, whatever object arises, we have to apply effort, aiming, and look steadfastly, observe steadfastly. And this is like grinding the glass on a lens, that as we do it, the power increases. So, for those who think that thinking is the way to know, if one tries to employ thinking in this, one will not be able to develop the practice. So, if you have that habit of thinking and analyzing, please try to put it aside completely as much as you can. Put it aside for the time being. So, because as a good relative, Sayadawji is trying to teach you what the Buddha taught over 2,500 years ago. And if you will accept and use this gift respectfully, then he will be very happy. And he would like to be happy in this way. So for the teachers here, they speak with true loving kindness and compassion. So as soon as the object arises, make effort, aim, and look carefully. So Sayadawji urges all, all of you to practice and use the Dhamma gift every second of the time. <laughs>